Good morning. We all doing good? Yeah. Anybody else have a hard time not just like couldn't take your eyes off of Nick's mustache? I, mean, <laughs> I didn't hear a word he said. I'm like, I'm like, what is he trying to do? No, I'm kidding, Nick. It looks good. Keep it, keep it going. Um, also, um, these. So I found out this is French toast cupcake, maple frosting, and chocolate covered bacon. Clearly made by Jesus, which means it is zero calories um, and brisket and yeah. So anyway, it's uh, yeah, it's a good day uh, to be at One Line, not just for that, but for what we're going to be talking about today from Matthew chapter five. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew fi- Matthew chapter five. Um, it's a good day, but I will uh, forewarn you that what we're about to read are some extremely hard words from Jesus. And so I'm just going to go ahead and say it now. This is not me. I'm just the messenger um, telling you what Jesus already said. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start uh, reading in verse 43. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, the words are going to be on the screen. Matthew 5, starting in verse 43, Jesus is speaking. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies And pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Uh, Throughout this series, it's a series we've called Binge Worthy, and really it's about aligning our lives with the way of Jesus, and throughout this series, we've been working hard to do that, not just to say that we're followers of Jesus, but to look at the words that Jesus said and then ask ourselves, what would it look like if we actually lived that way, If, if we actually lived the way of Jesus? Because the way of Jesus is extraordinary. It's gripping. It's binge-worthy. He turned everything upside down. When he came and he walked among us and when he taught, the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus taught were so different and so radical that people began to follow him. Large crowds began to follow him. Houses became so packed that people would crowd around the outside to try to get a glimpse of Jesus. One moment, uh, a house was so filled that some men carried a paralyzed man on a mat and tore open the roof to get to Jesus. Uh, The shorelines became so crowded that Jesus would have to get into a boat and teach from a boat. He was turning the world upside down. And over time, as Jesus taught, more and more people began to align their, their life with the way of Jesus. And every single time that happens... From the first moment a life aligned with Jesus, even till today, every time it happens, we get to sit back and watch something ordinary become extraordinary. That's what happens when God gets a hold of a life, and it's what we've been talking about in this series. And the passage that we just read is classic Jesus. The crowds would have been like, okay, here we go again, Jesus. This is so different. Jesus exchanges hate for love. He exchanges a vengeful heart for forgiveness and invites us to do the same, to say, make a trade. I've got something different for you. He makes an enemy a friend. 
And he essentially says to those early followers, if we were to put our own subheading on this, it would be, you know that Old Testament command to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, you're doing it wrong. And he's talking to people who have spent their lives trying to cross all the T's and dot the I's to live according to the law. And so what Jesus is doing here is he's actually responding to a misapplication of Old Testament law. They've been doing it wrong. So I want to take a, couple of, uh, a quick look at a couple of verses from the Old Testament law that they would be thinking about. Uh, this is from Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It's Old Testament law. Leviticus 19, if you skip down to verse 33 and 34, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you are foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And then Jesus comes along and he raises the bar. He sets a new standard for his followers. And it begins by helping his followers answer this question. Who is my neighbor? Well, the easiest answer for that, if we're thinking about who our neighbor is, it's those people who live in closest proximity to us, right? You might look at the person uh, immediately on your right or to your left, the the home's there, and say, okay, that's my neighbor. You might even uh, get a little bit more generous and say, anyone who lives in my block or like the the close three blocks to me, those are my neighbors. You might refer to someone, oh, they're my neighbor, even though they live a few houses down, If it's not a physical neighbor, we might, from time to time, we don't do this too often, but we might uh, include someone that we have kind thoughts toward. They're they're like a neighbor. But again, here, Jesus is trying to help us to reframe our understanding of neighbor. And you can tell that as people heard Jesus teaching, and as they saw him doing this, they were extremely uncomfortable with it. They didn't like what Jesus was doing, and and one of the ways we know that is from Luke chapter 10. Luke records it for us. There's actually an expert in the law. So as Jesus is reframing the law, an expert in the Old Testament law comes to Jesus, and he says, all right, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And some of you maybe have heard this story and where it's heading, but but that's how it starts. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you're an expert. Why don't you tell me? And so the expert in the law responds, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, yeah, that's, that's correct. Well, it's still not okay for this expert in the law because he's heard Jesus talking and try to reframe this whole neighbor thing. And so he asked Jesus directly, well, okay, Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells a parable. It's a parable of, of a man who's traveling along the road, and he finds another man. He's been robbed and beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. A couple other people had passed by, did nothing to help, but this man stops and he helps. And not only does he stop to help, he bandages his wounds, he pays for lodging, he pays for meals. He takes, he, he takes care of him until he's restored. That's the story that Jesus tells. And now Jesus refers to the man who helped the one who had been robbed as a neighbor. Now, no one would have had a problem with that in that original context, those original hears, except that the man who helped the one who had been robbed was a Samaritan, and the one he was helping was a Jew. And that just wouldn't have happened. Samaritans and Jews, they weren't friends. They weren't brothers. It was quite the opposite. They had nothing to do with each other. They were religious enemies. They were racial enemies. It just wouldn't have happened. And so they would have been asking, Jesus, are you saying that it's no longer enough for us to just love our neighbors? Now you're adding another command that we also have to love our enemies. And I'm sure some of them are thinking, like you and I might be thinking, well, then surely Jesus and I define enemy a little bit differently. Because some of the people in my life that I think of as an enemy, there is no way Jesus would ask me to love that person. They should get what's coming to them. 
So let's go there for a second with another question. Who is my enemy? Now, while some of you are like, okay, I got a quick answer to that question, others of you are like, well, I don't really use that word all that often. Enemy, I don't really have any enemies. That sounds a little harsh. I don't really talk that way. Maybe you don't use that word to describe individual people in your lives, and maybe you would use a word like rival or adversary or in-law or something like that. I don't know, but... <laughs> But, but you get my point. We, we, sometimes we don't think about it like, oh, I don't have enemies. So I want to define that a little bit to help us get some context for our culture. And let's look right at Matthew chapter 5 as some examples of, of what Jesus gives as an enemy. Uh, he says someone who persecutes you. And you're like, well, persecute? I don't feel persecuted. But it's really someone that opposes you. Or if there, there's ever been someone who's intentionally tried to hurt you or to wrong you, to make life hard for you. Uh, that's someone who Jesus would describe as an enemy. Uh, he also uses uh, the words evil and unrighteous, which essentially means someone who, whose life is different than you. If, if these are people who are trying to live according to Old Testament law, and then you have other people who are living a different way, that could be like an enemy. Here's the third one. Anyone who doesn't love you. It's interesting to think about it like that. Jesus says it this way, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? In other words, it's easy to love those who love you, which means the implication is that we must also love those who don't love us. That's a little harder. I'm sure that all of us in the room could think of at least one person that we would put in one of those three categories. Someone who's maybe tried to do harm to us, somebody who lives differently than us, somebody who doesn't love us. Again, somebody who's made life hard for you. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I, I, can, I can't think of someone. And Brad, if you only knew how much of an enemy this person was to me, if you only knew what this person had did, has done to me in my life, you would agree that I get an exemption from loving that person. And I think Jesus would give me an exemption too. Some of you are thinking, yeah, I get a free pass on that. And, and so I want to be the first to say that uh, for those of you that are in that spot, I'm sorry for what happened. I don't know what happened, but I, uh, I want to tell you what Jesus is saying here. But before I do that, I want to tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying that you should brush it off and act like nothing happened. If something's been done to you by someone uh, that has harmed you. Uh, Jesus is not saying that what happened to you was Okay. He's not saying that there isn't accountability and consequences for those that have wronged you, because there are. But I want to tell you what he is saying. Let's go back to his words. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. So a couple things I want us to understand here. Uh, the first is that Jesus isn't adding a command. He's not saying that, hey, now there's two commands. There's one command that you need to love your neighbor, and now I'm going to give you a second command that's to love your enemy. No, no, it's still one command. It's a command to love your neighbor even if your neighbor is an enemy. It's one command. And when we align our life with the way of Jesus, we are filled with his spirit that calls us to live differently, that empowers us to live differently, which means that our love no longer depends on what that person has or has not done to us. We love, and this is the hard part, in the same way that God loves us. We love in the same way that we would want our God to love us. Uh, did you notice what Matthew says in this passage? Again, this is episode 7, Sunrise for Bad Guys. Here's what Jesus says, God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Here's the deal. No one has ever existed on this planet by accident. And because of that profound truth, God's love for every created being is constant simply because of the fact that he made them. 
and he made them on purpose. His love doesn't change. His love is regardless of. Again, it's the way that we want him to love us, regardless of the things that we've done. There's absolutely nothing that you could do in your life to make God love you less. Nothing you could do to make him love you more. And I don't think it's just me, but I think all of us, we've done plenty of things that would be deserving of him loving us a little bit less. But in our darkest moments, he still loves us. He was still there. His presence could still be felt. In the biggest messes we've ever made, he is still there. The sun still rises, and the rain still falls. And that dark moment in your life, whatever it was, that that chapter of your life, that season of your life, that one mistake, the sun still rose and the rain still fell. And why does the sun rise and why does the rain fall? Well, the sun keeps rising and the rain keeps falling in order to bring life, in order to bring new life. And God's love keeps coming, and God's grace keeps falling in hopes that the entire world will experience the new life that Jesus wants to offer. And so Jesus says, if you're going to align your life with my ways, I mean really align your life with my ways, then you must keep on loving and keep on loving, regardless of A binge-worthy life keeps on loving and keeps on loving. And so what does that mean? Well, again, Jesus gives us a few examples of what it means to keep on loving even those who might be enemies of ours. One is to pray for them. He says, pray for those who persecute you. Yeah, I'll pray that they get what's coming to them. No, that's not what it means. Praying for our enemies is perhaps the purest and the deepest form of love. Because when you pray for someone in that way, you're praying a blessing on their life. You're praying that good comes to them. Maybe it's for a physical healing or for repentance for them or for them to experience the presence of Jesus. But I would encourage you that if you have someone in your life that is an enemy, someone who's wronged you, that immediately came to mind, begin praying for them. You'll watch God change your heart. You'll watch God set you free. And you'll realize that you've actually been shackled and in chains in your hate and in your unloving heart. And Jesus wants to set you free from that. He doesn't desire for you to live that way. That's one way that we can love them is pray for them. Here's another one also hard, meet their needs. God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Again, needs that are met, needs to bring new life. The Apostle Paul, uh, he says it a little bit differently, but it's similar in Romans 12, verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. And not like a Game of Thrones kind of drink or food. Like, I mean... Take care of them. This is radical. But it's the way of Jesus. Another way we could love our enemies is simply to greet them. You've done it. I've done it. We've all done it. We've seen our enemy or someone in a grocery store, and you've like gone. The, you're like hiding behind aisles. You were there to get like ten things. You got one, and then you left. If you greet only your own people, what are you doing? more than others. And and so like I said at the very very beginning of this talk, these are some tough words of Jesus. If you're following along here in Matthew 5, maybe maybe you read ahead a little bit because Jesus isn't done. It actually gets maybe even a little bit harder. And and almost like this next part just kind of comes out of the blue. Like Jesus said this thing about (laughs) loving your neighbors and your enemies and then he like adds this end part. He says, be perfect Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. All right, Jesus, I give up. Like, what are you talking about? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's really no way around it. 
Jesus is raising the bar. He's reframing the law, and it's taxing, it's far-reaching, it demands a lot of us. Aligning your life with the way of Jesus means that you will align all of your life with the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is not just something that, that we have to know about in our mind. It's, it's not enough just to know. It actually has to take hold in our hearts and begin to overflow out of us in the way that we live and in the way that we love. Our love must become a reflection of the one who made us. Now, with that said, there are a couple things that we need to understand about this statement to really begin to make sense of what Jesus is saying here. It's actually extremely profound. For starters, the word perfect, it's the Greek word teleos, and it literally means to be complete. Remember when Jesus said, John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have life to the full? He has this complete life for us. Be complete. So a little bit more of a word study here, because uh, Jesus asks many things of us, but perfection isn't one of them. So what's he, what, what's he saying here? And our English, all the English translations use the word perfect, and it's most likely because the Latin word is perfectus, which means to be rounded, to be whole, to be mature. And so let's look at a couple other places where that same word teleos is used in the New Testament. One of them is 1 Corinthians, Paul's writing. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the, and then the same word, mature. But not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Another one, Philippians 3, verse 15. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. One more, James 1, verse 4. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. All the verses use the same word. To be mature, to be rounded or whole or complete as followers of Jesus means that our words and our actions will be aligned. Maturity, wholeness, means that we don't get to say one thing and do another. In the same way that God acted out his love for us. He didn't just say, I love you. He acted it out for the entire world to see. It was a whole and complete kind of love. He acted it out. I love how one commentary summarized these words of Jesus. I'm just going to read it for you. I tried to write it in my own words, and it just, I kept falling short, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, there is a way of life. There is an authentic, deep, unhypocritical way of life. Jesus is saying, if you will come to me and trust in me and receive the power of the kingdom and be cleansed on the inside by the forgiveness and love of God that I offer and bank your hope on all my promises and let my ransoming death cover over all your failures and your imperfections, then you will be able to live this way. Not perfectly, but powerfully and holy. And your life will be the light of the world that proves you are children of God. I mean, are you grasping what these words mean for you in your life? The loving your enemy thing, no, it, it's not ordinary. It's not ordinary at all. It's radical. It's different. But again, it's why it's gripping and vengeworthy. It's the way of Jesus. It's the kind of living that causes crowds to gather in the streets and along the shoreline. But also, apart from God, guess what? It's impossible. There is no way you love that way simply by trying harder. It's just not possible. Loving your enemy is made possible by the creator of the universe taking hold of your ordinary life. Loving you in your darkest moment and then empowering you to love differently. The closer and closer you get to Jesus, the more and more you remember your own rescue, the more and more you'll be able to love in the radical way of Jesus. It's the only way it works. You have to get close to Jesus. And when you do, he'll take your ordinary life and he'll do something extraordinary. 
Because a binge-worthy life keeps on loving and keeps on loving. And at the end of the day, we all get to point the world toward Jesus. Go ahead and grab the communion that you received when you came in. If you didn't get it, go ahead and grab it in the back. We're going to sing for just a second, but I just want to make sure that you have this because we're going to be uh, in just a, a moment taking communion together. We're going to celebrate communion uh, together as a church. And as we do, I want to read one more uh, couple of verses, actually, two, two more verses. Uh, same chapter, Matthew 5, but just a little bit before uh, the words of Jesus that we just focused on. And here's what Jesus says Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come offer your gift. You know, Jesus is someone who, who calls us to not just say, uh, but to do, to, to actually live out our love. Again, it was a, it was a radical kind of living. Uh, communion, as we celebrate it together every week, it is a chance for us to remember and be reminded of the greatest demonstration of love our world has ever known that while we were still sinners, in the midst of our sin, Christ died for us. And so what I wanna do for the next couple of moments is have communion together, but also just to give you a chance, and we're gonna, we're gonna pray together uh, for those people in our lives. We're actually gonna practice and do what Jesus taught us today. We're gonna pray for those that right now, maybe we need to forgive. Maybe we need to be reconciled too. Maybe there's, maybe there's no way to, to fully reconcile, but we're still gonna pray. 
because of what it does to our own hearts. And just allow us to to reflect on these words of Jesus. You've heard that it was said to love your neighbor as yourself, but also love your neighbor and your enemy. So let's celebrate communion together. The bread is the reminder of Jesus' body that was given for us. You can take the bread and eat. This cup is a reminder of the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us on the cross. Let's take the cup and drink. If you would go ahead and stand with me. Uh, We're going to continue worshiping, uh, but I want to lead us in a prayer uh, just before we do. And so, for as much as you are able... Would you just pray along with me that God would stir our hearts, move us closer and closer to Jesus, uh, to love in the way that he has called us to love. Uh, God, we come before you humbly uh, as your servants who are in need of your grace and your mercy every single day. God, I pray that every person in this room would experience your presence in a very real and powerful way this morning. God, that as we are recipients of your grace, that we would respond with love to the world. God, we pray for our enemies this morning. Uh, We pray for those who have maybe caused harm to us in our lives, who have mistreated us, who have let us down, who have hurt us. We pray for those who have hurt those that we love. We pray for those whose ways are different than our ways. God, we pray for those who don't love us. God, we pray this morning that you would give us a love that is beyond ourselves. that we would love in the way that Jesus loved us, regardless of. And God, that as we live and as we love in the way of Jesus, that you would set us free, that you would make us mature and complete and whole, that we would experience a life that is truly life. God, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. sinking this morning.
in all of the universe is at your feet. And Lord, over everything, you are near. All of the universe is at your feet. been go so great celebrating with you this morning. Hope you'll stick around, enjoy uh, some connection time, maybe meet some people that you haven't met, and that you'll join us next week for our final episode of our Binge Worthy series. Some of you probably feel like you've spent a lot of time in church. Well, next week we're going to be telling the story uh, in the Old Testament of a woman who drops her kid off at church and then essentially leaves forever. Things get a little crazy after that. I hope you join us next week, episode eight, Marco Polo with God. We'll see you next Sunday.